Hi guys, welcome to Chemo Glow, where the glow doesn't define me, I define the glow. This episode right here was actually a little hard to do because it's my first guest that I'm interviewing who has lost his wife to cancer. What do you do in that moment when you're told that your wife cancer is back? In that moment when you need to be strong to carry her through, knowing that there's no cure in sight, but healing's on the other side. My guest today shares his perspective from the time that his wife was first diagnosed to the time that she found healing on the other side. Guys, cancer doesn't care what you're doing at the time. They've been married for over 20 years had six kids between them. And here I am telling you about the episode already. Just listen in. It's a good one. Peace. Hi, guys. Welcome to Chemo Glow, where the glow doesn't define me. I define the glow. I am excited. So excited about my guest tonight. I know I say that all the time. I'm so excited about my guest. But you guys met him in season one of Chemo Glow Live. And I actually wanted to bring him back for February. So he is going to be hopefully on our February 10th um, live because we're moving to Wednesdays. And I think I'm going to drop his early because... That's how excited I am about him coming in. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself. I'm Michael, and the last name is Virgil. I have two first names. Don't ask me what my parents were thinking about. I have no idea. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining me. It's after nine. You're so welcome. I it's appreciate it. Not a problem. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. Well, I'm going to warn you that my babies may come in here. They may not. So we're just going to roll with the punches tonight. Come on in and sit down and have a seat. (laughs) We will never get off this podcast if that were to happen. (laughs) So last season on Chemo Glow, one of our lives, you came on with Jeanette Gregory. She told me that she had this awesome man that can come on and talk about how it is to go through cancer with your wife. And as soon as you got on, well, actually, before you got on and I called you and I was like, you know, I'm bringing you back. Right. Right. (laughs) And, you know, so I'm going to get a snippet of what you have with Jeanette, but I'm going to end up bringing you back for not just a live, but a podcast and a live. So I'm so glad that you are here with me tonight. Me too. I'm glad I could be here with you. Well, tell me a little bit about um, how you were introduced to the glow. When I say the glow, I mean the event in your life that changed your life forever. So Um, give me a little background. Well, you know, it, it, to go back a little bit, 2007, early 2008, um, I was at home and uh, got a phone call um, from a doctor, wanted to speak to my wife, Rose. Um, I had no idea what the call was about, so I called her and told her that, you know, her, her doctor had called, it was one of her oncologists, and needless to say, the phone call was not a great phone call. Um, she called me back and <clears throat> told me that um, they had found something and they weren't 100% sure, but you know, they thought it was cancer at the time. Well, mm-hmm. it, it turned out to be that. Um, that the moment I can say this, the moment I, I didn't know what to say or what to do at that moment because it was just like still in shock. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I left the house and I went up to her job, you know, and she came outside and we stood in the parking lot and we cried together for a little while, you know, and then um <clears throat> she said she wanted to go home. I said, You're able to drive? She said, Yeah. So she got in her car, got in my car. We drove home, you know, we got home and we talked about it a little bit. And then, um, you know, just <laughs> things just started to happen a- after that. Um, yeah. So, you know. Well, before you received that phone call, how long have you and Rose been married? What was your life before that, this phone call? Oh, my God. So let's, God. let's back let's, up. Let's, let's, let's back, back up. up. Go ahead and tell you, me this really, love story let's, let's right really quick. Let's back up and tell me. Let me <laughs> tell you this love story. Because when I tell people this, they go, are you kidding me? So 
when I met Rose, I was I had moved from Hilton Head, South Carolina to Charlotte. Mm-hmm. I met Rose in Charlotte. Um, I was working for Walmart. I was a supervisor for Walmart, and I transferred to a store in Charlotte. It was a brand new store. So I was in the store one night shopping for stuff for my apartment, and I saw her. And when I saw her, something came over me said, you're going to be with her. Now, I can tell you exactly what she had on at that moment when I saw her. She oh, had on wow. a purple polka dotted dress. The dress was purple and the polka dots was white. Uh-huh. Okay. And she had a little flip handle <laughs> underneath. Okay. So, so this is where you're going to laugh at. So I used to see every day. Hey, how you doing? I used to speak mm-hmm. to it every day. How you doing? How you doing every day? So because at that time, I just, I just started letting this bed grow. I'm trying to see how this thing is going to work out. <laughs> so anyway, because I had the young appearance, you know, they all, everybody thought I was really young. They thought I was in my 20s. So initially, they was trying to fix me up with her daughter, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> you were so, looking that young. So, yeah, that, I mean, it really, truly. So um, um, needless to say, Janet was like, he's too old for me. So... <laughs> It, it wound up, you know, that that Rose and I, we started talking, you know, we uh-huh. went to lunch a couple of times and we started talking and and then, you know, and then we started dating and mm-hmm. then, you know, one thing led to another and, and looking around again, we got married. Oh, wow. Um, it, it was just like, it was out of the blue. You it married was whirlwind. Me. Yeah. Will you marry me? Yeah. It, it, I don't even think it was a year, you know, oh, that wow. we were seeing each other. Yeah. And it was like, will you marry me? Yeah. And, you know, we got married New uh-huh. Year's Eve. Oh man! And, the, oh, wow. and the, the 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 beautiful thing about it is, her birthday was the sixth of December, minus the twelfth of December. Yeah. Christmas, New Year's. So all the entire month of December, it's that a celebration. Was your month. Yeah, it was our month. So you know we did we did a lot of traveling. Mm-hmm. We would go to the places that were out of norm, like how now everybody's going to Gatlinburg and all the other kind of stuff. We were doing that long before, long before, Mm -hmm. long before. It was Um, popular. Oh my gosh. You know, we, we drove to Niagara Falls one year. I tell anybody, if you live in Charlotte and you feel like you want to do that drive, it is like a great drive. You go up 77 and you just ride it as far as it can go. The great thing about it is you go to, it's, it's on the coastal side. So you go through Erie, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. you know, Buffalo, New York, and all that kind of stuff. And when you get into Pennsylvania, outside of Erie, you get into Amish country. <clears throat> I don't know how many drinkers are looking at this podcast. <laughs> 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 but you can go as you go along. There are vineyards along the way. And we stopped at this one vineyard. And I tell people, Amish people are like some of the most humble people you ever want to meet. The humble and friendly. So we pulled up to the vineyard. The guy was outside. He said, come on, come on in, come on in. So we go inside and we go down into the, into the wine cellar and had all these variations of wines for us to test. And I got to oh, wow. tell you, I had a little bit of a tipsy on when we left, but it was okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were so friendly. Yeah, so they were so friendly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that, you know, we, I mean, we, we just, it, we did so much together. You know, every time people said, were you guys going out? Because every time you look, we were going somewhere. Yeah. And my mom, my mom used to call us, were you jet setters going now? Because we were <laughs> always going somewhere. So, you know, so, so when the other part, you know, again, the other part when, when the cancer came yeah. about, you know, but it, it really didn't change our lifestyle because we'll get into that in a little bit. But in the yeah. beginning, it was like, okay, we dealt with it. Yeah. Remission. Go back to doing what we normally do. Okay. You know, so you we went through, um, Rose went through what type of treatment the first time? The first time it was, it was chemo and radiation. What they did was put the little tattoos on it so they could do the targets. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the chemo, um, you know, again, that was like, was different because <laughs> we went through the phase because she had long hair at the time. We mm-hmm. <laughs> went through the phase of, I remember, I'll never forget the morning she was in the bathroom and she comes out and she's crying because the hair is in her hand. She said, oh, mm-hmm. my hair is falling out. She said, I said, it's okay. You don't understand. I, hey, look, I, yeah. I, I get it. I uh-huh. get it. I get it. You know, and so I was trying to be the calm in the storm per se. Like, yeah. okay, it's just your hair. It'll grow back. It'll grow back. So, you know, it had to, had to deal with that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Then that, the more that it started to come out, you know, her brother, her younger brother, who was a barber, he lives in Georgia. He came up, 
cut the rest of it off. And I told her, I said, you look real sexy like that. I said, I like it myself. <laughs> you know, so. so oh, so, I love it. So, My husband you know, was so, the same yeah. way. So, you know, you, 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 you know, we went through that part and then, you know, the cancer went into remission. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and again, you know, we just went back, you know, to, to doing what we normally did, you know, yeah. and, and, and the thing about it is that when, you know, we go to meet an on onc- see her oncologist, what he wanted, he wanted the family, the immediate family to be there so he could let everyone know what the procedure, what the process was going to be for her. Mm-hmm. Well, he wasn't expecting the size of our family. So we, when we got there, we had the whole, <laughs> we had the whole waiting room because he was going, <laughs> he took us back to one of the exam rooms. He said, I got to get more chairs. I said, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, so, you need a conference room. Yeah. So after he told us what was what was going to happen, you know, he said, anybody got any questions? Me, I said, look, let's just go ahead and do what we need to do. Let's make it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and that's what we did, you know, and, and, and you know, if she was around, she'd tell you I was her biggest cheerleader. Oh, wow. You know, so from what, the front of, what kind of cancer did she have? She had triple negative. Triple negative breast mm-hmm. cancer. Triple right. negative. Um, and, you know, which at the time we didn't really know how serious it was. Yeah. You know, we really didn't know that there wasn't really anything out there that could basically fight it off. Yeah. We thought that, you know, when it went into remission for those four years, we thought, hey, we're done. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. You know, and then it reared itself up in, in year five. Yeah. You know, and then it went into remission again and it came back, you know, the third time, you know, so. Um, <clears throat> so let me ask you. Before sure. You, um, as, as a husband, as a man, as a provider, as a caretaker, because you had how many kids together, all together? Well, we all between her kids and my kids, a total of six. A total of six kids. Mm-hmm. So here you are um, managing different emotions, mm-hmm. different people, mm-hmm. different little people, as you call them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how was it not just hearing those words, but actually... Um, having to be that cheerleader at those times when, when it was, when it was hard because everybody was depending on you. Right. Um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I never really thought about it. Okay. I just, I just did what I felt I needed to do. Sounds what, like my husband. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. What, what just came naturally to me, you know, it, you know, I've, I've had people to ask me, how did you deal with it? So on. I just did what I felt like I needed to do. Mm-hmm. I would just say that I did what God laid on me to do, you know, mm-hmm. and, and people always talk about God, this guy, that black. I just say, look, I know for myself what he'll do for you in mm-hmm. your moment of need. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just, I just, you know, I had a strength that I didn't know that I had. Um, was it easy? Nope. No. <laughs> Did I have good days? Oh yeah. Did I have bad days? Oh yeah. I had a Did couple you have of bad a support days. group? Uh, did you did you no. have a support group? No, it was just so, me. Just you. Just me. Okay. You know, I would, you know, like like my mom, I would talk to her periodically. And I tell people that it's it's hard to explain to people what you're dealing with mm-hmm. when they haven't experienced it for themselves. You can't you can't explain that to anyone because they'll look at you like you got horns growing out of your head, whatever the case might be. And mm-hmm. if they haven't been in that moment, they're not going to really they'll, they'll go, oh, I'm sorry. Or, yeah. you know, whatever the case might be, because they genuinely don't know what to say. And yeah. I get that. And I mm-hmm. understand that. So <clears throat> I basically weathered it. A lot of it on my 99 percent of it on my own. Yeah. You know, even when I was even when I was at my worst moment, no one knew. You know, yes. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't want to bring anybody into that realm. You know, um, <clears throat> Rose used to ask me, are you OK? I'm like, yep, I'm OK. But I wouldn't tell her, no, I'm not OK right now. But because I didn't want her to see that, you didn't know, so I just see. I just weathered it, you know, and I just did what I needed to do. Um, <clears throat> now, you had this huge family that mm-hmm. you talked about. Mm-hmm. How did that family come into play when you were going through when you guys were hey, say, hey, you want our all family going to be here? All our family are going to come. What parts did other people play um, in your life at that time? Well, because it, 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 it was just like a shock for everybody in the beginning. Yeah. You know, and so 
you know, it was like, I guess I just want to say, you know, everybody felt like it was going to be okay, whatever the yeah. case might be. Um, I'm not going to say that anyone wasn't concerned or anything like that, but, you know, the kids are growing, they have their own lives, so on and so forth. Uh-huh. So, excuse me. So basically, I just pretty much dealt with it, you know, on my own. If if they needed to be there, they would be there. If she needed them to be there, they would be there. Uh, we never really asked anyone to participate to help we ne- mm-hmm. we never did we didn't do any of that you know mm-hmm. my my whole thing is and, I, and i'm a firm believer in it that you know whatever is laid on your heart what is that whatever you're led to do you do mm-hmm. i shouldn't have to ask you to do anything no one should have to ask you to do anything if this is your mother if this is your father if this is your sister brother whatever the case might be you step in and do what you need to do i'm not going to ask you mm-hmm. you know and and she didn't ask anyone either we just it was just basically like i always said her and I, even even my sister in law, her and her husband been married over forty years, and she said to me, "Me and me and me and Gerald was her husband. We don't we're not together like you and Rose. If, if you saw Rose, you saw me. Yeah. If you saw, saw me, you saw her. I mean, yeah. it's like we were we we had our own friends. She had her friends. I had mine. But yeah. it was always us. So so because it was always us, it was like okay, I'm doing what I have to do. I'm not going to ask anyone, you know, to step in to help to whatever try to understand what i'm dealing with what she's dealing with you know if you want to understand it then you know if you want to come to the treatments or Mm -hmm. whatever the case might be then come on but i'm not going to beg you and i'm not going to ask you know i'm just going to do what i need to do and i did that so when did you meet jeanette i met jeanette had Rose already think. been diagnosed? She the had already been diagnosed. Yeah, she had already been diagnosed. Actually, yeah, she had been diagnosed the second time. So I met Jeanette. How I met Jeanette was um, she was having a an event mm-hmm. and Rose was invited to go. Uh-huh. And she, she wherever she's going, I'm going. I don't go. care. I I'm going. And then was the Rose of <laughs> what was the chocolate rose? Chocolate ball? rose ball. Yeah, but oh. prior to that. There was an event that she had at, I think it was the, I forget which hotel it was, but it was just all women. And all it was women. Just, it was myself, the cameraman, and her husband. Mm-hmm. We were only guys. Uh-huh. Okay. So I met Jeanette at that event. That was in 2012? 12, 13, 14, 15. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. something like that. 2012, somewhere around there. Because I met, I met your wife. Right, I actually right. met your wife and I met you briefly because right. I rode in from Raleigh Durham, gave a speech, and I rode back. I remember out. you talking about that. Because I, <laughs> I was about that. newly diagnosed. Right. My hair was growing back, and right. Jeanette was like, I need you to come speak. And I was like, Right. Uh, maybe. And that was the <laughs> first time that I actually got up and I told my story. Right. And then I heard your wife. Right. And and that was her first time doing it as well because yeah. because she had been asking me leading up to it. Well, honey, what am I going to say? What should I say? I told her, I said, go and just be you. Yes. Do whatever is on your heart. Just say whatever's on your heart. I said, it'll come. Just do your thing. Yeah. She's like, okay. And even when we were going, she's like, I still don't know what I'm going to say. I said, just <laughs> say whatever. Just I get say it. it. Yeah, just... <laughs> Just say whatever's on you, and it and it and it turned out to be a great speech. It turned out amazing. to be a, turned out to be a great speech, um, yeah. and that and that was the time when she was, um, I think, it was the third time. That was yeah. the third time when she was diagnosed. Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 you know, after that, it just you know it, things just started changing after that. You know, okay. so. And how was that for you, with knowing that okay, we we rode this wave the first time. Right. And now it's turning into something more, you know. Right. So so here's the thing. The second time, you know, everybody's like, why does this keep happening? Blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You know, and we and we went through the we went through it and um, you know, we did what we needed to do, you know, we did the walks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. The third time that it happened, we had the discussion. I told I said, if you want to tell the kids, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. It's up to wow. you how you feel. You know, I just let her make the call. Yeah. Um, she said she didn't want to say nothing because at that time they was trying this drug out and they said that um, she wouldn't have 
the hair loss and, you know, everything else that went just that her hands would get tough like leather. Yeah. So, you know, they suggested other cream stuff like that to keep her hands soft. Um, what happened with, with, with that particular drug, <clears throat> I'm going to have to back up a little bit. Okay. So when, when they did that, you know, told us to do that, um, things started changing a little bit. Yeah. And it had reached the point she said, well, you know, I guess we go ahead and tell the kids, you know, yeah. and she didn't want to do that um, because because some things were starting to happen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we wound up having to tell the kids and then it was just like this whole thing. But <clears throat> when it was given to her this this other drug that she was taking and what happened, which we didn't know. She had got sick mm-hmm. um, after this after the drug, she tried the drug. So we wound up going back to the doctor. They couldn't figure out what was going on. So they kept her in the hospital. We're in the hospital eight days. Okay. We're in the eight days. They were running tests. They were doing this. They were doing that. They were doing a whole bunch of different things trying to figure out what was going on. Okay. Comes around again for her treatment. They gave her a treatment again. She winds up back in the hospital. This time we was in the hospital for seven days. Mm-hmm. Okay. We actually spent our anniversary. New Year's. New Year's Eve in the hospital. But she was doing good. She was doing okay. They were still trying to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was just a roller coaster ride. So come to find out, because I'm taking a shortcut here, but come to find out the drug that they were giving her, she was having an allergic reaction to. Mm. Because it was one time where she got the treatment and my daughter Kim was with her and they had left the hospital. They weren't even away from the hospital 10 minutes. They had to turn right back around and go back because she was having a problem breathing. Yeah. So that's when they found out that she was having an allergic reaction to the drug. Um, so we dealt with that. Um, in the meantime, to, to, to show you how genuine her oncologist, her doctor, oh man, I can't, even, I can't talk about her doctors enough because when she was first diagnosed from her primary care doctor and everybody in between, you know, they were calling her and checking up on this. Like, I can't believe not my rose. No way. You know, it was just that that thing. But when it had reached to the point where it kind of sort of ran out of options, per se, mm-hmm. um, her oncologist said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your case and I'm going to present it at a symposium that they were having in San Antonio, Texas. OK. And they took her case and presented it. Because when actually when it was diagnosed the third time, because she kind of wigged out and I was like, okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So her oncologist and um, I can't remember the other doctor. Yeah. They called the house that night about eight o'clock. Yeah. You know, and told us, wait, before you freak out, we want to be 100 percent sure that what we see is what we're seeing. Yeah. Okay? So don't freak out yet. So we went through that that phase. But anyway, like I said, they presented her case at the symposium in, in San Antonio with all these oncologists, all these guys from yeah. everywhere. And um, there really wasn't a, 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 per se, a cure. Yeah. Um, they were saying the only other hope would be, you know, clinical trial comes up, yeah. you know, that, that we could participate in that. So when we go to see her oncologist one of the last times, we're in his office and he says, look, I run out of options. I don't, I don't know what else to do. You know, he's like, I really like you guys. I don't know what else to do. So he said, you know, and he brought up hospice and immediately me hospice. I'm like, Oh Jesus, not hospice yeah. because I didn't know all what hospice did at the time, you yeah. know? And then I will tell anyone that's listening to this podcast, hospice is not what you think it is. Hospice makes it so that your life is more comfortable. So you can try to have some sort of normalcy in your life. So true. Okay. So um, don't think it's a bad thing. I we experienced hospice three times with mm-hmm. um, my brother, mm-hmm. my father, mm-hmm. and my mother. Mm-hmm. And each time, it was, it yeah. was grace. It was grace. I mean, it, I, I can't say enough about them. I know, like on the last broadcast, the first time I talked to you about it, I was yeah. telling you what was what was what was so cool about it for me because you know i'm that kind of guy yeah you know they had asked you know because i was planning to take her to hawaii in Mm -hmm. in january was going to do that 
So when hospice stepped in, hospice, hospice stepped in around about March, somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So they had asked, you know, when they came in and introduced themselves and, you know, that whole spiel, they had asked, you know, is there anything that you guys wanted to do anything? I said, yeah, well, actually, I was planning a trip and I was taking her to Hawaii. You know, and they said, well, we can do that for you. And I'm like, really? You can't? It's like, yeah. And it's free. I said, free? I said, free 99? That's my price. <laughs> You know, and they said, you know, we even give you a little little money to spend. I was like, OK, well, that sounds good. I'm all in for that. So they had to check with the doctor first. And, you know, mm-hmm. they got together and, and the doctor came out, you know, and basically said that they thought this trip would be too much for her because yeah. by that time the tumors had spread around her lungs and her heart. So they said they thought it would be too much stress on her. So it was any place else that we wanted to go. And we said, well, we like Florida. So we wound up going to St. Pete. Um, you know, we had a grandson that lived in Tampa. Yeah. Um, and and we went and they, I mean, they put us up at a place that was incredible. The whole the whole that whole weekend was an incredible weekend for us. Um, you know, um, watch seven couples get married on the beach. Oh, you know, because wow. we were on the beach, the beach front, not the view, the front. OK, <laughs> the front, um, you know, and and she wasn't doing too well, but she made the best of it. Yeah. Before we went on the trip, you know, because I knew she wouldn't 100 percent. She wasn't even close to 100 percent. I told her, honey, look, if you don't want to go on this trip, we don't have to. We can just stay home. We can just do something else. She's like, no, I want to go on this trip. We need this trip, blah, blah, blah. I said, OK, fine. Hospice Fools First Class, you know, the, they had limo come pick us up, take us. Wow. I mean, everything. I mean, it was just fantastic. What I didn't know then, which... I realized after the reason why we went on the trip, because she knew it was going to be the last trip that we took together. Yeah. I didn't know it then. Okay. Yeah. So we, we go and, you know, we, she had an oxygen concentrator, you know, that kind of thing, little portable one, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, we, we made the best of it. Um, and then when we got back, you know, prior to us getting back, my sister-in-law said, the doctor said he wouldn't be coming back to the house. He said, because when she comes back, you know, she would start to go downhill because, I guess because they've seen it so much that, yeah. you know, they know. And I mean, true to form, just like clockwork, we got back probably about a week and a half, two weeks later, you could just see the the, the change, the progression and the change. And, and mm-hmm. you know, it 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 was, um, I tell people all the time, watching somebody that you love go from 100 to zero is, yeah. is, is a hard thing to watch. It's a hard thing to deal with. But at the same time, you do what you got to do. You yeah. do what you need to do. You know, and, and and I knew that that she was relying on me more than anybody else. It had reached the point where she didn't want anybody else to deal with her but me. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and I was I was going to work. I was trying to work at the same time. And she, you know, there was a time where I was wanted to, wanted to say, you know, honey, you need to go to work because the bills got to be paid. I said, don't worry about the bills. The bills are going to get paid. I said, you're the most important thing to me right now. I said that that'll take care of itself. So when it reached that level. My son-in-law and my daughter, you know, they stepped in um, to help out so I could go to work. Yeah. But then my son-in-law was like, man, I don't want to mess this up because you do so well. I don't want to mess it. You're not going to mess up. I said, it's OK. I said, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, they stepped in and helped. And then again, as I said, it had just reached the point where she didn't want anybody else to help her but me because I basically knew what to do with her. Yeah. You know, it, it was like um, there was a day it's like when when it started reaching a point, you know, family was coming, you know, coming to stay with her and stuff like that. And I know Jeanette had called me one day and she told me she had a basket that she wanted to bring by the house, you know, and Rose really wasn't up for no visitors or anything like that. So, you know, I was, I was just basically like the family just told me, take a break, you know? So I was out and about, I went and got my hair cut, you know, did a couple of other things just like to take a break from it. And Jeanette called me and she asked me how I was doing. And at that time, I had pulled up to a rest stop. I got in my car and I drove. I pulled up to a rest stop in South Carolina. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, and I sat there for a little while and I talked to Jeanette, you know, so on and so forth. And then um, after all that, you know, I wound up going back to the house. So, you know, again, looking at that, looking at e- that event, as I called it, yeah. it's an event that forever changed me. You know, yeah. and, I, and I tell people I was there in the beginning I was there at the end. Yeah. Okay. I was there at the beginning when she was diagnosed. I was there at the end when she went on to paradise and do what she do. Yeah. You know, and, and, and for me, 
again, as I said, it's a moment that forever changed me, forever yeah. changed me. So. <laughs> How would you say, when you say forever change you, mm-hmm. I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, you've been there at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And you were there at the end. Mm-hmm. And then you guys did what you guys love to do, even if, she, you know, she wasn't at 100%, was travel. Mm-hmm. Like, that, you, y'all were jet setters. Mm-hmm. And y'all st- still did that all the way up to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, how has it been for you um, in the early? Because she passed. When, when did she pass? 2015. May 1st, 2015. May 1st, 2015. How, how was it at the beginning for you after um, Rose had passed? It was, it was hard. It was, it was really, really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when she passed, after the funeral and, and all that, you know, I was in the house, you know, and I've told, I told a few people this story that um, after she passed, that night, the dogs, our dogs, Jack and Josh, they, especially Jack, Jack, that was her baby. That yeah. was our first. He, so I'm in the bed and I'm laying down and I could like hear them, but it's like, you know how you sleep, but you're not really sleeping. Yeah. It's like you're kind of halfway there. And the dogs were just like wigging out. They were just like all over the place. And the only person they did that for was her. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm laying in the bed and I felt like this little, like peck on my cheek. Yeah. Right. And I looked up and the dogs, you know, after the dogs just calmed down, I said, okay. So the next day I said, okay, she came. Only thing I can attribute that is her spirit came back to say, honey, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. You're going to be fine. After that, um, trying to have some sort of normalcy per se. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, my son-in-law, my brother-in-law, everybody's trying to get me out of the house to do stuff. I know that in, um, in September, you know, we went to a football game in Atlanta, Monday night game, Atlanta played Philly. Uh Um, you know, and it was just a, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, something to get me out. My brother-in-law, really, this this is, you're going to chuckle at this one. So (laughs) before the game, you know, cause it was a Monday night game. We we just hung out all day, all that. But before we went to breakfast at IHOP. Uh-huh. So we sit in IHOP at a booth and there was some ladies across the way. Mm-hmm. And one of them kept staring. She kept looking at me, kept looking at me. So my brother-in-law's like, nah, I don't think you need to talk to her right now. He said, because your game is probably a little bit weak right about now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. But, but, but between him, you know, and a couple of other people, you know, that, that were really close with her, you know, they all told me the same thing. They said, you know, Rose would want you to live your life. She would want you to be happy. She wouldn't want you to be miserable. She would want you to be happy. Yeah. You know, and so and so I was trying to find that or figure that out, for lack yeah. of a better term. Um, when it when it started coming up towards the end of the year around her birthday, you know, the holidays and stuff like that. That was yeah. when it was just really, really became hard. And I was like, man, this is because December this is a lot. was your month. Exactly. So and it, and, it, and it was just it was a lot, you know, in the beginning, you know, people were calling me, you know, checking on me, you know, seeing how I was doing, so on and so forth. But as time went on, mm-hmm. that started to die off. Yeah. You know, that 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 support system started to die off. I, I tell people all the time, my dogs, I, I'm not even going to say and tell you no lie. My dogs, Jack and Josh, uh-huh. they're the ones, them and God is what got me through this. I kid you not. Because I know that after she passed, I was trying to sit down and eat a meal at the house. Right? Yeah. I cooked a meal. Cooked a meal for them too. Because they like to eat with me. <laughs> <laughs> They're good dogs. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in the kitchen and we was sitting there and I couldn't eat it. And I got up and I went and, and sat on the stairway in the house because our house is upstairs, downstairs. So I sat on the stairs and I started crying. So my dog Jack comes, right? He comes to me 
he puts his paws up on me like to say, Daddy, it's okay. It'll yeah. be fine. It's okay. In the back of my head, I could hear a rose saying to me, honey, it's okay. Go sit down and eat your meal. It's all right. Just go sit down and eat your meal. Yeah. And I got up and I went to the table and I sat down and ate a meal. I had to deal with that. Yeah. Um, I went through the phase of, this is the first year, and I went through the phase of, I was downstairs in the house and I just went off at God of like, look, you said, this is what you said. This is yeah. what you said. We did, I did everything you said, but you still took her. But here's what I came to realize through that whole event. Yeah. Our call is not God's call. Yeah. Okay. What we want is not what the patient want. Yeah. Okay. Because we all wanted her to be here. Yeah. She didn't want to be sick anymore. She was tired of fighting that battle. Yeah. She was tired of going. She was just tired of fighting that battle. And that vessel was beat up. That vessel was tired. And she was just tired. And all she wanted was peace and not to be sick anymore. Yeah. Okay. And I always tell people, he didn't cure her. He healed her. Okay. Put that one in your pocket for a minute. Okay. He didn't cure her. He healed her. Okay, because when she left here, and I tell people this all the time, this is why I started getting emotional now, because you might hear my voice go up a little bit. Yeah. But when she passed, okay, my daughter Kim was in the other room. Okay, when I, she was resting on my chest when she passed, and I called her, Rose, Rose, Rose. She didn't move. But when I moved her off of me and I went around and looked at her, she had that pretty smile on her face like, I'm at peace. Mm. I'm good. Mm-hmm. You know, and I got my daughter, Kim, to verify that she was gone because she's a CNA. She came, she said, yep, she's gone. Okay. In that moment, I found comfort to, I found comfort knowing that she was really at peace because she had the smile on her face. At the funeral, everybody said, oh man, they really did her up really good. I said, no, that's yeah. how I found her. They, yeah. they didn't put that smile on her face. That's how I found her. She yeah. was really at peace. So after year one, year two seemed like, year two got a little bit better. I was still going through the- The motions. Uh, the motions, trying to adjust. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't traveling. I didn't do a whole lot of traveling. I wasn't mm-hmm. wouldn't doing any traveling. But I had, I was going because my family, I have family that lives Hilton Head, South Carolina. Yeah. I was coming home like every other weekend. You know, okay. just visiting and stuff like that. I have some friends that work at at at, at Marriott Hotel who, you know, fixed me up a couple of times with the rooms and stuff like that. You know, me mm-hmm. and the boys, you know, living like a king. I ain't had to spend no money, none of that kind of junk. So, you know, so it was good. So then my mom said to me, she said, why don't you come home for a while? You know, find your job, you know, and then, you know, see how things go from that point. Uh-huh. I said, Okay. But what I found out was that her girlfriend, rest her soul, she passed away last year. Um, she said that my mom was worried about me because I didn't have the immediate family yes. in Charlotte. You know, So I wound up moving back to South Carolina after a year and a half or so, you know, almost two years before mm-hmm. I finally moved back. Um, and I was still going through this thing. You know, this, this, whatever, yeah. um, trying to date. That's a I, whole that's other my ball next game. question. <laughs> that's a you know, another ball game. Since you told me nothing was off limits. Right. Um, tell me how that was for you. Just were you going through the motions at first? Um, how did you approach it? It was like, I wouldn't even necessarily say going through the motions. Mm-hmm. It was like talking to women mm-hmm. and then listening to what they're saying. Uh-huh. And it's like, that's not registering with me right now. Yeah. It's like, it's like, have I been away from this so long that I forgot or mm-hmm. has it changed that much? And what I, what I came to realize that it had changed. Now, yep. to, to show you what I'm talking about, was that year one? Yeah, I'm back. I'm gonna back up a little bit. So uh-huh. after she passed, 
There was a post on Facebook. Steve Harvey had a guy on his show. Mm-hmm. It was talking about relationships, right? And what women should do and blah, 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 blah. And I'm saying, okay, no, that, 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 no, that don't compute. Yeah. So I commented on it, okay? Uh-huh. When I commented on it, I, Regina, I kid you not, I got 2,000 hits off my comment. Okay, what one, was your comment? One negative. My comment was, I said, you women are out here looking for men, okay? Uh-huh. You're not the hunters. We hunt. Uh-huh. You're the prey or the catch, for lack there of a better term. You're uh-huh. the catch. You can't wear the pants. You don't wear the pants. Uh-huh. I said, and this is why a lot of you have bad relationships. I said, because what happens is your facade of the person that you think that's supposed to be with you or for you because they look this way or because uh-huh. they that way, it's not necessarily the person for you. Okay? I said, you're sitting here because they were talking about credit and so on and so forth. Uh-huh. So part of my comment was, I said, okay, so let's just say he has good credit. Let's just say he has a great job and have all those things that you look for. Uh-huh. I said, but what happens if he beats on you? I said, what happens if the only time that you come first is if when it comes to sex? Outside of that, he doesn't even really want to be with you. He doesn't even pay you any attention. You're not first. Yeah. I said, so help me understand all that. I said, what we're talking about is materialistic things that really don't matter in a, in a relationship. Mm-hmm. You want someone that's going to, what our job is supposed to be as a man, love, protect, and provide. That's what we do. Okay, that's our job. Anything mm-hmm. else in between that, I call a perk. Okay, mm-hmm. here's here. I had this conversation last week with some women, <laughs> with some women, and, it's, and it's so crazy because they always talk to me. They always say, "Boy, you just be so real." <laughs> I tell people this: sex in a relationship is not a requirement; it's a perk. Mm-hmm. It's a perk. It's not a requirement; it's a perk. Uh-huh. Think about what I just said. Now it's a perk because I'm just going to put it to you this way: if you don't feel like it, it's not going to happen. Uh huh. If you don't, it's not going to happen. So in addition to my comment, when I was telling them about the relationship, when I was telling them about you're out here hunting, you're not built to hunt. That's what men do. We hunt. Mm -hmm. You're the catch for lack of a better term. I said, and if you present yourself in a particular way, how you present yourself is what you're going to attract. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was, it was probably about, I don't know, might've been about that long, (laughs) but, um, (laughs) I got 2,000, I got 2,000 hits off that comment, Uh you know, and I had women reaching out to me, wanting to talk to me, you know, because again, I'm already settled in. Yeah. I know how to cook, clean, take care, provide all that other kind of stuff. You can do it all by yourself. I didn't know, (laughs) I did not know at the time that there were a whole lot of women out there looking for a man like me. I did not, he said times has changed, right? Has changed. I did not realize that, you know? And so, you know, just like when Rose and I were married, you know, I used to get all the time, you got a brother? I'm like, yeah, he's married, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because like, you know, when Rose and I, when we got together, you know, because I cook, clean, sew, iron, do all that kind of stuff. And, and she, used to, she used to like me to iron her, her work clothes because I used to iron them like they've been in the cleaners. Oh, wow. You know, I, I even told her, taught her something. I told her a trick. I said, my mama taught me this trick. And I, <laughs> and I tell people all the time, they say, I didn't know that, so I'm going to tell you now. Okay, what is so it? So when you buy, like, a brand new shirt uh-huh. and it's wrinkled, you know, uh-huh. if, or your husband's shirt and it's wrinkled, it's, you know how it's folded? Yeah. What you do is you take it, take the shirt, take it out and get your spray bottle and mist it uh-huh. with water. Fold it back, stick it in the freezer for a little bit just so it gets a little... A little tight, uh-huh. take it out and shake the shirt off and put it on the ironing board and iron. It don't even need starch. I thought you were going to say put it in the dryer because that's the mm-hmm. only thing that I... Mm-hmm. Put it on the ironing board and iron it. When you iron that thing, it's going to be so sharp, you, you'll think it came out the cleaners. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rose loved you. Hey. You took care of her. Hey, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, and that's, that's, the thing that everybody said, mm-hmm. you know, said, man, she really loved you and you really love her. And it's like, you know, I, j- I just tell everybody that my, my situation is not unique. Yeah. It's just that I just took it to a level that most don't, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've, I've gone through the good and the bad 
of marriages, you know, yeah. but but the thing about it is, is that you do what you're supposed to do. You do what mm-hmm. you got to do. You do what you have to do, you know, and then everything else is irrelevant. And, you know, when when this this whole thing came up with the cancer, I mean, like, again, as I said, it just it really threw me for a loop. It again, as I said, it forever changed me. The dating thing. Yeah, that was that's that's just a challenge in itself. That's just the yeah. challenge because the 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 thing I, I that I've learned to do now to get past is that if I meet someone, uh huh, I s- try to see if they have the same qualities that roles have. and it's not intentional. It just happens, happens. that way. Yeah, it's not it's not intentional. It's not like I'm screening them out or anything yeah. like that. But it's it it just happens. Like no. <laughs> you're like, no. you feel like, are you dating no. right now? Yeah, in between, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's, it's, gen- well, it's gen- COVID too. Question. Yeah, it's COVID too. So that <laughs> yeah, and and on, and see, and I'm in a medical facility, so I deal with that every day. See that every day, <laughs> you know. So 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 it's 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 interesting for lack there was a better term because I have women approach me, yeah, you know, and I and I tell people all the time, you're gonna laugh at me, but I don't care. I tell people all the time. <laughs> I don't have a rap. I don't have a game. I've never been one of those guys. That, <laughs> hey, baby, how you doing? Can I get your phone number? I've yeah. I've never been that one. Mm-hmm. It's always been where, and it even goes back to when I was in high school, when women approached me. Yeah. You know, I became the talk of high school when I was in high school because I used to play ball. And one of the prettiest girls in school, uh-huh. my friend of mine told me, he said, guess who like you? I'm like, who? He told me like, out of here. Like, yeah, I was, what's your number and everything? And I was, I was blown away by that. Yeah. But the thing, the thing that got her was when I invited her to my house. Uh-huh. You know, I was living with my mom and I invited her to my house and I made her lasagna. Uh-huh. You cooked. And hey, I got back to school and all I heard was Michael Virgil, I heard you can cook. <laughs> Let me say, your mom set you up. Yeah, she set you, know, you up right but, but, from yeah, and that's what I clothes said. to cooking, everything, everything to taking care of Absolutely. not just yourself but others. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And Jeanette tells me that you are serving others in the capacity right. um, to continue to have Rose out there by talking and telling your story. So tell me what you're doing with that. What, what is your give back? What is your, what is your glow? What are you doing? Well, here's, here's what happens. And it it always happens because I always have on 99% of the time I have on pink. Like now I got on the bands. I know. know? I see. So, and and I'll either have on a shirt or whatever. And I always have on pink. So, what happens is when I have that on, and it doesn't matter what time of year it is, someone like, just this just happened to me last week Saturday. As a matter of fact, was in Charleston, you know, picking up a car. Just bought another car, picking up a car, and I'm walking through the mall because I had to go pick up some shoes. And I'm walking through the mall, and was outdoor mall actually, and mm-hmm. was some ladies out there. They had the little booth set up, and the lady said, "Somebody in your family had cancer." And I told my told them about my wife. I said, "My wife, and you know, she passed away." Blah blah. So at that point the opportunity opened itself for me to tell the story. Yeah. Okay. And what happens is every time that opportunity presents itself, it's mm-hmm. always at the right time. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I tell the story. And when I tell the story, I kid you not, Regina, everybody is so moved to where they're in tears, yeah. to where they're making phone calls, calling mm-hmm. family relatives saying, Hey, I got to call you, tell you, I love you, you know, so on and so forth. You know, so, so what happens with me, I haven't had a platform where, like, somebody asked me to come in and be a speaker and talk yeah. to people like that. Mine is like, I'm on the front lines, yeah. seeing people, and I'm telling this story either one-on-one setting yeah. or wherever. On a podcast. Or, or on, a, <laughs> on a podcast. You know, I mean, the, 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 one of the best stories that I have in regards to that was the, that year one when she passed, I was in the AT&T store. Here in South Carolina, big store. And um, I'm in there and had on pink shirt, the hat, you know, pink and black sneakers, Mm -hmm. you know. And so sales guy, he said, what's up with the pink? And I started telling him. Mm -hmm. And when I told him, (laughs) 
when I started telling this story, there were customers in the store. They stopped shopping. Okay? And I'm standing in the middle of this floor in the AT&T store. It's a huge store. I'm standing in the middle of this floor, and I'm telling the story. The employees stopped working. Okay? And I'm telling the story. And the deeper I got into the story, the more intense it became, the more passionate I became about it. The lady was back there. She was crying. You know, one guy said, man, I got to go outside and call my wife and tell her how much I love her. You know, one employee was sweating on the arms because he was so overcome with emotion. Mm-hmm. So the lady said to me, she said, I don't, I don't know how you're standing there telling this story. She said, because you, you just, just like, you're so passionate and your strength. I said, let me tell you something. My strength comes from watching her go through what she went through and God, I said, that's the only answer I have for you. That's all I've got. Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, and right now, what I'm telling you, this is not, this is what's being laid on me. Okay. Yeah. At this given moment, mm-hmm. I've been in Savannah, Georgia at Wet Willie's. Mm-hmm. I had on the hat. My dogs was outside. The girl outside was holding my dogs while I was inside. <laughs> <getting the> beverage, <laughs> I come back out and I'm in there and a couple walks in and I had on the breast cancer hat. And she asked me and I started telling the story right there at the bar. Yeah. And her husband said to me, man. He said, you need to be going around the country telling the story. He said, because a lot of people need to hear this, you know, and and there that's not the first time I've heard. I've heard that from numerous people. I've been numerous places and told this story. And a lot of times it just happens. It's not like I have intent on going to tell somebody yeah. the story. It's like the, the opportunity presents itself and I share it. And when I share it, it, it has never been a situation where. How would I say anyone left, for lack of a better term, disappointed? Or untouched. Yeah, because they were touched. Everybody I've talked to has been touched by the story. So, so again, as I said, I haven't been given a platform where, okay, we've got a thousand people coming in. We want you to speak, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. I haven't been given that kind of platform. Yeah. My platform is just like out and about. Out and talking about. To folks. Excuse me, out and about and talking to folks. <laughs> Excuse me, talking to folks. Yeah, I've had a church. I've had a church that wanted me to come speak, uh-huh. you know, and, 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 and tell the story. But, you know, COVID, you know, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> my platform are the people I encounter. That's my platform. That's how I share the story, because I found that I get for me a better result. Mm-hmm. I get a better reception. Yeah, I get more of an for like, it's more intimate to me versus if if I'm in a room with a thousand people, 699 people out of those thousands are probably going to be like, yeah, whatever, Whatever. you know, and the rest, the rest are going to be like, wow, you know? So it's like, if somebody wants me to come and do that, I don't have a problem with doing that, but I already know that you're going to have that percentage of people that's going to be like, but it only takes that, that one, just that one. I was Jeanette's one, that one right. one person. Exactly. And because of her, um, my life forever changed. Right. But I am still here. Exactly. And then when I called on Jeanette, I said, hey, Jeanette, I would love for you to come on. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, when you guys were <clears throat> on, I couldn't hit those um, questions fast enough. <laughs> and I was like, we only have an hour, guys. <laughs> right, I tried right. to do two hours and right. y'all was like, no, shut it down. Right, the first right. episode I did. Right. So I was like, even when I met you, because I, when I'm interviewing my guests, mm-hmm. I get, you know, my questions are, is there anything off limits? Mm-hmm. And I might ask some brief, like maybe two or three questions because mm-hmm. I wanted it to be an intimate conversation. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, let me stop you. Don't tell me nothing mm-hmm. else because mm-hmm. I already know you're going to be on in February. And right. I was not playing. Right. And, you, and, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad, you know, to come back on, you know, because there there is a lot in the story that I want to share with people. Yeah. Um, and you and you and you really can't do it in an hour. You can't. You, know, you just you, you, you can't you can't do it in an hour. Um, you know, my my main reasoning, one of the reasonings and and it comes to me every single time for sharing her story, you know, and telling the people what I've gone through 
what we went through as a couple yes. um, to help others. Yeah. You know, whether whether even even if you have a loved one who's not sick, who's, mm-hmm. you know, going through that. But this is some information on maybe you might need to tweak some things in your life. Yeah. You know, because you never know. You might have this kind of event come up. Yeah. It could be your wife. It could be your sister. It could be anybody. But you might need to tweak a couple of things in your life yeah. to make you look at some things different. Yeah. So, you know, so so that's the satisfaction for me is is sharing it, no longer keeping it in to myself, uh-huh. if that makes sense. It does um, because your your story, her story, mm-hmm. your story together. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that my tagline says the glow doesn't define me. I define the glow. Exactly. You're defining your glow. Right. Your give back. Like you said, I'm I'm in in a store and someone asks. I'm wearing this and someone asks. The glow doesn't define you. Exactly. You're defining the walk. You're sharing Rose's story. You're sharing your story. So, so many times caregivers get left out of the story, right? Right, right. You know, because <clears throat> we're thinking we're going through, we're, you know, but your husband, your loved ones, they're going through with it, with exactly. you too. Exactly. And after, you're the first person that I've talked to about what do you do after, <laughs> you know, after you, you, I tell people you you can't stop living. You you, you gotta keep you living. Can't stop living. Yeah, you can't because I've thought of that question when I was diagnosed. Mm-hmm. So where does that leave me, and where does that leave my husband, mm-hmm. and when do we have that conversation about whether or not I'm going to be here or not? Right. You know, I always mm-hmm. say that we need to finish our will. We need to do this. We need to do that. Not because that cancer is present or was right. present. It's right. Because that's something more that we need to do. You need to have those honest conversations. conversations so exactly. when it does come up, yeah, it's something that it's not foreign to you. It's exactly. still hard to talk about. Right. But it's not foreign to you. I agree. I mean, and, you, even not cutting you off, but that yeah. when you said that, that brought 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 something up when, and I might have mentioned it in the first show, maybe not, mm-hmm. but I know it's in the book. And that was one of the, the great things that I'm glad that Jenna asked me to be a part of the project because I got well, to talk about Tell us about, about the things. book. Tell us about what you're talking about because well, some of the audience the, don't. They, well, the book, is, the book is titled Love Me So I Can Live. Um, mm. it's, it's, it. it's a group of men along with Jeanette and her husband. We're telling the story from a caregiver's perspective. What, mm-hmm. what we deal with you know, that emotional roller coaster ride that we go on, that of asking why, that being mad, you know, we're, we're telling, hey, we go through it too. We might not have the symptoms, we not might feel it, what they're dealing with, but we go through it too. So mm-hmm. that's generally what we tell the story, what we're talking about. For me, I was glad she asked me to be on that project because for me, in my writing, and, and I'm not a writer, Tell you that right mm-hmm. now. I'm not a writer. <laughs> but in my writing, what I wrote in this book, I was writing either what I was experiencing that day, yeah. what I experienced the day before, or what I was just going through overall. And and there were quite a few things, you know, in the book that I talked about. One of them was what we just talked about just now, having the conversation where you're talking about what if, what if, what if. Yeah. What happened with Rose. Two years before she passed, she had been trying to prepare me for the moment. Two years before, because that power passing wasn't even on my mind. It was like, whatever. Yeah. And we were in the kitchen. I will never forget it. We were in the kitchen. And she said to me, honey, we need to talk about what if I'm not here? I'm not going to tell you exactly what I said, but yeah. I, will say it, I will say it this way. Rose, I'm not trying to have this bleeping conversation with you right now. Mm-hmm. And she said, okay. I was like, okay. And I left it at that. Mm-hmm. But it won the conversation. We wound up having to have the conversation yeah. almost two years later anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. but if me, because I think of everything in a positive light, no matter yeah. how negative it might be, I mm-hmm. think about everything in a positive light. So in regards to Rose passing away, that wasn't even on my radar. Yeah. Not at all. Not in the least bit. I didn't even see that. Yeah. Um, and and when it happened, even even leading up to when it came back the third time, I told her, I said, 
it's going to be a little bit different this time, but you're going to be okay. Little did I know how different it was going to be. Yeah. Okay. But, but again, learning to deal with that, Mm -hmm. learning to overcome that, learning that life must go on. You have to go on with your life. You can't let that bog you down. Yeah. And I got to say, life is good. Yeah. You know, life is always good. It would be better if she was still here. Yes. But that's okay because I carry it with me every day. Yes. Um, I talk to her every day. Hey, yes. honey, how you doing? You and you know, know she's whatever. healed. Yeah, you know, I think she's healed. You yeah. know, so, so, and I'm good with that. You know, and I'm okay with that. It's just like, you know, I've only been to the grave site twice. Okay. People wow. ask me, why don't you go to the grave site? I said, because she's not there. She yeah. was never there. And I tell them all the time, she was never there. Mm-hmm. I said, what's at the grave site is just the vessel that she was here in. Yeah. That's it. That's the vessel. I don't want to, I'm not going to go talk to her vessel. I can talk to her at home. Yeah. I don't need to go to the grave site and talk to her. I can talk to her at home. Yeah. Which is what I do on a regular basis anyway. We even went up in the car. Yeah. You know, I hear one of the songs that used to come on. They were like, they go, I saw honey, you know, something <laughs> like that. I love so, it. So, you know, so, so, you know, for some people, the grave site is, is, is a way of comfort for them. Yeah. For me, the grave site is kind of like a pain in a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. It does. Um, I had, it, it's like, after Rose passed, I said I wasn't going to any more funerals. I was done. I, yeah. I'm not, I just, I can't. Even even back up a little further, when my uncle passed away, my favorite uncle passed away, and I had to say eulogy at his funeral, and this was in Bermuda. I said I was not going to any more funerals. I was done because it's so overwhelming. It's so emotional. Mm-hmm. But lo and behold, I didn't realize that I would have to go to, to my wife. aunt's funeral. Mm-hmm. You know, go to my wife's funeral. My aunt had passed away year before last. Yeah. Um, my mom said to me, I know you didn't want to come. Uh, and I'm here in the same state now, same town, yeah. same state. My mom said, I know you didn't want to come. I said, the only reason why I'm here, you know, is because it's my aunt. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been there. Be. You know, because it's, it's, it's a draining event. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, and it's e- an emotional event. And then, you know, everybody wants to go, oh, why? And yada, yada. I don't want to hear all. I don't want to hear that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't want to hear any of that. Don't tell me what you should have did, because this is, this is what I tell people now when they tell me that. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, but mm-hmm. you didn't. So I don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear it. And I tell them all, you can take that for whatever it is, but I don't want to hear that. You shoulda, you coulda, you woulda, but you didn't do it. So don't talk to me right now. I don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. And I just keep it moving in that sense, you know, but. I, I would say that that's probably one of the things that you are teaching people is that mm-hmm. be in that moment. Right. Like be present. Be, be in present. the moment so be you the won't moment. have to say those things. You know Absolutely. that you, you've given your best um, through the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, because cancer, when it comes, it, it's coming to seek and destroy. It comes. And, it, and, and that's what, and that's basically what it did. It kind of, it kind of wrecked, it wrecked how it wrecked havoc on our household. To be honest with you, it did. Um, it 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 really divided the family in 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 ways that I would have never thought. Mm-hmm. You know, but but what I attribute that to is the human side of us trying to control something that we have no control over. Mm-hmm. So then, what ha- what happens is because we can't control it, so then we start taking that anger or whatever we have and channeling it. At other people, yeah, for whatever reason, instead of saying, "You know what? This is bigger than me. This yeah. is not even about me." Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But but a lot of us have a tendency to make it about them. I, I can tell you a good old <laughs> story about that one, but I am not. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I can tell you that too because I I can really go there. I can really go I there. I don't want to go there, but I'm. Not gonna ugly. go there, but exactly me, because it will be ugly. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, I have told Jeanette the story. <laughs> so she, <laughs> she knows, like you said, you yeah. pulled over and talked yeah. to her. I've yeah. had 
two pullovers yep. and I've talked to her. Yep. Like, and you know, and, and I can't and, believe. <laughs> and, and and my my love and my friendship for for Jeanette, I can't even explain that because it's amazing. Jeanette was there for me. Man, at so many, so many different moments. Yeah. I mean, I talked, I talked to her last week, as a matter of fact, because we <laughs> we always laugh. She's, you know, if she's like Michael Virgil, she because she always calls by my whole government. Man. Yeah, Michael Jerome Virgil, right? <laughs> she said, uh, "I'm at the CVS pharmacy," because she just says when she goes to CVS pharmacy, it, it always had to be. She would call me and every time. She would call me. She's at CVS pharmacy. Yeah. You know, so she said, I didn't see this pharmacy. I said, I'll call Michael Virgil to see what's going on. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, but you know, she has been, she has been a real light for me. Yeah. You know, she has really made me um, look at things different, you know, and just say, okay, it's okay. It's, um, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. And, you know, and then when she asked me to be on the project on the book, I, there's an immediate yes. You know, sure. Well, I've never written a book, but I've got some things that I want to talk some about. I things say. <laughs> I, I am looking forward to hearing those things because when we do our live, that's exactly what I want to talk about. Okay. I want to talk about that caregiving side, that honest side. That You know, those are the things in the comments they wanted to hear more about. Right. And we're going to give it to them. And I hope by February 10th, check your schedule, see mm-hmm. if you're available, because I think mm-hmm. that's exactly what I'm going to push you're live because okay. we're going to go ahead and throw this out here on the 30th. And I'm so looking forward. I'm looking forward to speaking to you and other men mm-hmm. in February. And I'm doing all men every Wednesday at eight o'clock because I want to give back to that caregiver, give back right. to that that backbone, give back to the ones that... Uh, have been there for their wives, um, Mm -hmm. continue to be there for their wives, their loved ones, and how much that we really do appreciate you. It has been a pleasure Pleasure. chatting with you. Look, I can go a whole other hour. All I can say is this. (laughs) When we go live, when we go live, when we go live, I'm going we to going really live. We going live, and I'm going to really give it to you. So, like that's like Jeanette told you, buckle up, hang I on. I cannot <laughs> wait. Well, you stay on. I'm gonna close this out, guys, by okay. saying the glow doesn't define me. I define the glow, and my guest tonight is defining his glow. I can't wait to see you guys on February 10th. Look for the podcast coming out January 30th where podcasts are available. Guys, have a good night. Sound editing is provided by Josh Masters. If you like what you hear, please rate and review the podcast in iTunes. Connect with Kimo Glow on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also find more content at chemoglow.com.